week in review slash trivia. We're doing a little bit of everything today. Uh, strange week. I was unable to do that yesterday. Focus myself up. There we go. <laughs> um, Troy, thank you for coming. Was unable to get to it yesterday, so we are going to do a little combo today. We're going to go pretty quickly through the seven stories of the week. And then we're going to follow it up with trivia, most of which focuses on those stories. So tell me how you like it when we're done. If it's nice to have the refresher ahead of time and then kind of like a classroom, do a pop quiz on what we learned. <laughs> so we'll see how that goes. Um, just ran upstairs a little out of breath. I'm going to take a quick drink of water right off the bat this time. So, we're going to run through these stories pretty quick. There were only six of them. Had a little bit of a mistake last week. Take my phone off the microphone. A little bit of a mistake last week. Had a day where I forgot to put a founder out. I thought I did, and I didn't. And I'm going to cry about it, and we'll get by. All right. Let's pop over here to the wrap-up page. And it looks the same to you until I pop this up. There we go. Ah, uh, Cato. We are starting with Cato. We started a new Anti-Federalist last week. Pull my mic a little closer. I'm really all out of it today, huh, guys? <laughs> Cato. Uh, probably George Clinton. We'll never be sure. But uh, of all the anonymous anti-federalists, the historians are pretty sure that this one's George Clinton. Uh, in Cato number one, I accidentally popped up the wrong Cato here. It should be Cato number one. Uh, he starts off pretty slowly and says, we need to take a calm, cool, collected, reasoned look at this constitution. We shouldn't let anyone persuade us. You are smart. You can decide if you like it or not. You should decide on your own. Now, next week we talk about Cato number two is a lot of fun because Alexander Hamilton reads Cato's calm, cool, collected reasoning. And, well, he gets a little angry. If you watched this morning's video, <laughs> yeah, you'll know. Uh, Hamilton ends up getting real angry and writing under the name Caesar, not the Federalist. He first writes under Caesar, and he is real furious. He attacks Cato. He attacks basically everyone. He, he literally says, uh, I don't have the quote in front of me, but he literally says, uh, take it. You, you should enjoy it and be, say thank you. <laughs> um, uh, and that doesn't work very well, uh, as we'll see, but we'll get more into that next week. Essentially, he just says, I follow your self-interest. The, the Cato number one is like most of the anti-federalist papers, um, the anti-federalist who wrote series of papers, multiple series of papers, uh, it, they, they all start out the same, which is like, here, we got to look at this. And there's not a lot of substance to it. And Cato's no different. Uh, he does say, uh, there's one quote here I like, uh, that you can't freak out and just do it because, quote, a man who merits the confidence of the public, end quote, wants you to do it. That, of course, is a reference to George Washington. Uh, and he also says, quote, the best of men may err and their errors, if adopted, may be fatal to the community. So uh, that's pretty much as far as Cato goes in the first Cato paper. Uh, and we're not going to sit on that too long because, like I said, there's not a whole ton of substance to that particular one. Now we're going to Robert Troop. Maybe Trope. I think it's pronounced Troop. Robert Troop is a little fun. A little fun. A lot of fun. As it says next to me, uh, college Hamilton's college roommate. So... Uh, he was like about a year or two older than Hamilton, but like most college students, Robert Troop took out a roommate, and it was a young man named Alexander Hamilton, just transferred him from Princeton, who would not let him graduate early, uh, and they were studying together at King's College. While they were there, things got a little heated. His buddy Al was making big statements in the public square and rallied the troops, as they say, and they actually started a militia on campus of the college. Now, first they were called the Corsicans, later they were called, uh, sometimes they're referenced as the Hearts of Oak, or Hearts Oak, and they would literally drill their militia drills on the lawn of college. So, great job. <laughs> um, they end up, uh, if you watch the musical Hamilton or listen to it, uh, there's the play where, there's a part of the play where it says, let's go steal their cannons. Uh, Robert Troop was part of that group. That was the group that stole the cannons. Uh... Just after this, the two friends split up. Alexander Hamilton goes back up to, or he stays in what we now know, basically Manhattan, and stays in artillery. Uh, Troop goes up to the Bronx, and he serves up there. Troop's actually uh, captured during the Battle of Long Island, and he's held in prison for several months before being exchanged. He's actually held on a prison ship, which, as we know, is 
horrifying. Uh, he is fortunate to get out, does get out. Uh, after he's exchanged as a prisoner, he is pretty quickly brought in as an aide-de-camp to Horatio Gates. And he serves with Gates for a while, including the Battle of Saratoga, where Gates famously becomes the hero of Saratoga, though we know that Benedict Arnold was the particular hero of that engagement. Anywho, uh, Hamilton, I'm, I'm sorry, uh, Troop ends up uh, staying with Gates once Gates becomes, takes over uh, the board of war. Uh, after a while, the Continental Congress creates a board of war to oversee George Washington doing his job. The board of war runs, it really is behind the Conway cabal, which attempts to kind of overthrow uh, Conway. Oh, thank you. Sorry about that. I just got a, a coffee delivered. We're getting coffee delivered today, nice and hot. Uh, we realized late in the day that uh, I'm pretty tired. <laughs> I got a lot of talking to do. So anyway, I'll be up late tonight. Uh, continuing with Robert Troop. He's with... Uh, Gates, Saratoga, Gates takes over the Board of War, which, as I said, is overseeing George Washington. And the Conway Cabal kind of stems from that, which was the only real attempt to push Washington out as commander of chief. Now, I don't, I never saw anything engaging Robert Troop with this, but Robert Troop continues working with uh, Gates as secretary of the Board of War. And in this situation, he's with the Conway Cabal, more or less. Uh... Now, uh, like I said, I don't see anything of Troop actually being with the Conway Cabal, but it's very interesting because he and Hamilton were so close during college, and now you have Hamilton working on Washington's staff, and you have Troop working on Gates' staff when Gates is essentially trying to overthrow Washington. Anyway, uh, Gates serves, uh, Troop serves through most of the war. After it's over, he goes and he studies the law, and he actually studies the law in Albany and then helps his friend Alexander Hamilton publish the law. Is <laughs> one day yes, yes. Emily is the the, the most dedicated Patreon supporter. I'm, I'm gonna side note right now. Uh, Troy making the joke that my spouse uh, is a big supporter. Uh, if it weren't for her, this wouldn't be able to happen. You know, there are so many like tonight. She's gonna put the boys to bed. They'll hear me talking about the American Revolution from a room over. Uh, I, without Emily, this would not. None of this would happen. So, she gets the biggest thanks. Um. Anyway. <laughs> Uh, a troop, despite having been on Team Gates while Hamilton was on Team Washington, they work together, uh, and and the troop actually helps Hamilton study for and pass the board and become a lawyer. They work together at the Schuyler Mansion in Albany, which if you're ever in upstate New York, go to the Schuyler Mansion in Albany. It's a really fascinating place where the Schuyler sisters grew up and Hamilton got married and studied with Robert Troop for the law. These two gentlemen then become important lawyers in New York. Uh, Famously, Hamilton was part of the New York Manumission Society, as was John Jay and many other American founders, Hercules Mulligan. Robert Troop was not only a part of the New York Manumission Society, but he was actually the first person to preside over a meeting of the organization. The first meeting of the Manumission Society, uh, Robert Troop oversees, essentially. And yeah, I'm fixing my shirt. It's not, it's not my best. This is not my best day. <laughs> this is not my best review. Anyway, after presiding over the opening ceremonies of the New York Manumission Society, whose goal was to eliminate slavery in the state, uh, he becomes an important Federalist, and he supports his old friend in all the things he does. Now, Troop doesn't succeed to Hamilton's levels in the national government, but he does become a, a member of the federal government. Uh, first, he spends about a decade, the first decade of the history of the United States under the Constitution. Troop is a clerk to the federal district judge, and then he's actually chosen to replace the person he cloaked for by George Washington and spent several years in a district court. Robert Troop is a fun character, uh, very, very close with Alexander Hamilton, even when they were on opposite sides uh, of the party during the war. Uh, and let's carry on. We got we only got 15 more minutes left. We got to get through these people. Start trivia at 830. I should have put a thing out. I, I should. I will. Actually, I'll note it later, but I've been working with another software program that's not really ready to launch yet, but I think trivia is going to be a whole lot more of a blasty blast uh, once I get that up and running. But John Schenck and the Ambush of Geary. Schenck's kind of a rando, but he has a really important role in turning the tide of the American Revolutionary War. 
Uh, Shank was from New Jersey. He was 25 years old, had already been in the militia for a while. And once Lexington and Concord comes around, the militia decides to join the fight. And he is elected by his contemporaries as their captain. He serves as captain of his unit. Uh, he would serve in this capacity for the entirety of the war. And I'll remind you that New Jersey was the crossroads of the revolution. There was a whole lot of skirmishing going on pretty much constantly in New Jersey throughout the Revolutionary War. Then, on December 14th, 1776, Captain Shank goes home to have a furlough. He goes home on a break, and as soon as he gets home, he's told, hey, there's a bunch of redcoats snooping around. So, instead of taking his break, he compiles a makeshift militia of his friends and family to go scout out the scouts and ambush them. And they do. And it, what follows is called the Ambush of Geary, because not only do they attack, the surprise attack this group of uh, pay, uh, redcoats that are walking around, uh, they kill the leader, whose name is Cornet Francis Geary, Cornet being the lowest level British officer at the time. Uh, the redcoats just weren't paying enough attention, and Shank and his merry band of men easily defeated them. This has a tremendous effect on the war because, as I said, this happened December 14th, 1776. Immediately, the British turn around and change the way they do scouting because they say, we can't just have our scouts out like this. They're getting ambushed. We need to have, we can't have, we need to have bigger groups of scouts that are moving more tactically. And therefore, there are, they're moving slower and there's less groups because they're consolidated. Days later, George Washington crosses the Delaware into New Jersey, and he is not found out, largely because there's less scouts for the British around to find out. Now, the Germans overseeing Trenton should have known it was coming, but they didn't quite take the threat seriously. But putting that aside, uh, it was much easier for Washington to take both Princeton and Trenton in New Jersey, which were astoundingly important moral victories uh, after a tremendous series of losses over the past eight months or so. Uh, and we have Schenck to thank for that a lot. Ryman. Uh, one more thing about Schenck. Again, he's not a character we know a lot about after the war ends. Like, he kind of fades into uh, obscurity. But he... Uh, he put, fought in almost huge numbers of battles in Jersey and Philadelphia, but he became a wanted man from the British, especially after the ambush of Geary, to the point where when he would sleep in his house, he'd have people standing outside standing guard, and if there was no one to stand guard, he would go out and sleep in the woods so that no one could come find him at night. John Schick. Oakley Doke, who's next? Let's rock through it here. Polly Cooper, I'm going to take a sip of this hot coffee. Watch me burn my mouth. Ow. Yes, I spilled it. <laughs> anyway, Polly Cooper. Polly Cooper is someone that I didn't know about until very, very, very recently, which I'm really embarrassed about because I live pretty much in the part of the world where she came from and studying so much of the revolutionary history, not just around the country, but especially in the area I live, I'm, like most of you, I'm sure, particularly interested in what happened here. Somehow, her name escaped me until a few weeks ago. Um, I, and I don't know if I should be embarrassed about that. I never came across it, but I, I'm perplexed that I had not heard of her. So, Polly Cooper was part of the Oneida Nation. The Oneida Nation were one of the six nations involved with the Iroquois Confederacy in upstate New York leading up to the Revolutionary War. Now, because of a gentleman named Samuel Kirkland, who we're about to talk to after Polly Cooper, probably should have done him first, but I didn't, uh, Samuel Kirkland was a preacher who convinced the Oneida and Tuscarora nations to side with the Patriots during the Revolutionary War, while the other four nations didn't. They left, they went off, and fought with the British. Polly Cooper was part of the Oneida nation, and during the starving times at Valley Forge, the Oneida people wanted to help their neighbors. So they actually came over. Uh, they walked from upstate New York to Valley Forge a few hundred miles, carrying bushels of corn to feed their starving friends. Now, Polly Cooper was the one woman who joined 47 approximately other soldiers in this journey. Um, now, I want a side note here. Most of Polly Cooper's story comes down through... Uh, oral traditions in the Oneida 
uh, Oneida Nation's history. We know that these soldiers did bring food down. That is a fact. Uh, and Polly Cooper, there was certainly a woman with them. Some of what goes on for the rest of the story is hard to verify with primary resources, though the statue next to me indicates... At, at, the statue next to me is at the, uh, the Society of the American Indian, I believe it's called, in Washington, D.C., the, the Mu National Museum of American Indians, I think is the title of the uh, museum in Washington, D.C., and, and she's had other items on display around the country for decades. So her story is taken as true, but I, I, I like to note that, unfortunately... Uh, there's not a ton of primary resources to cite on this. That being said, Polly Cooper comes down with her friends. They bring corn to the starving soldiers of the Continental Army who just want to eat the corn right away, but they have to stop the Americans from eating right away and inform them this is not just yellow corn, it's white corn. I didn't know this. I learned this recently. White corn, you need to cook a certain way so that you can digest it or it could possibly even kill you. Uh, and Polly helped teach the soldiers that, uh, teach, yeah, the American soldiers how to properly cook this corn. After that, the soldiers left, uh, the, the Native American soldiers left, but Polly stayed behind because she wanted to heal the sick men in camp. And she did this using many, uh, traditional herbal remedies that she knew. Fortunately, she did this for long enough where the Continental Army actually wanted to pay her for her service. But Polly said, no, you, you know, it's her tradition, not to take payment for helping your friends and your neighbors. That is just something you're supposed to do. Eventually, Polly goes with some of the women who were camp followers to the local town, and while there, she happens to notice a particular black shawl she really liked. And she points it out, and the women buy it for her as a gift. And that is essentially their way of saying thank you for her work. Polly Cooper goes back to Oneida and kind of disappears into the annals of history, but that black shawl that she had, well, it uh, it's still around. And that's one of the reasons we really believe the story to be true. The black shawl has been displayed, I mean, at the Smithsonian, as well as a variety of other important museums and places around the country. So that is the story of Polly Cooper. How we got? We got six minutes left. Two more people. All right. Let's see. Let's rock through it. Samuel Kirkland. All right. So Sammy Kirk's a lot. He was a preacher who went to upstate New York before the war. As I alluded to earlier, he became friendly with the Oneida Na uh, Native Americans in the Tuscarora. Uh, his goal was to convert them to Christianity. It went sparingly, I suppose, but he did convince them to side with the Patriots during the Revolutionary War, which is no small feat because there were a lot of loyalists in that area. It was frontier. And we're talking about Native American territory. Uh, you're right, Jeremy, she was. Uh, it was Native American territory, more or less. He was out there. Uh, the only other people who were really important to the Natives was Sir William Johnston, who probably would have been a loyalist had he not died just beforehand. I mean, his name was Sir William Johnston. So had he not passed away in 1774, he probably would have sided with the loyalists. His son does... Uh, and Joseph Brandt is, I believe, like a brother-in-law. I think I think William married his sister or his aunt. I forget the exact familial relation, but yeah. So Kirkland's out there on his own, and somehow he convinces the uh, Oneida and Tuscarora to side with the Patriots. Now, he doesn't play a big role in the war. He was a preacher. Uh, he was just kind of an interpreter out there. But his role becomes more important afterwards, because just after the Revolutionary War concludes, a bunch of New Englanders move out to this part of the world where I live now, uh, because uh, upstate New York was a frontier that was getting settled. And I know it seems weird that New Englanders would move to New York, but they just went east, and eventually New England became New York uh, and settled these this part of the world. When they get there, they know that the Native Americans who were the Iroquois were fighting with the British, and they didn't care for that. And then Kirkland played an important part in explaining to many of the Yankees that showed up, no, 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 these, this nation here, this is the Oneida, these are the Tuscarora, they were on our team, remember? Blah, 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 blah. And um, he did a, a, it was really important in making sure those peoples were primarily left alone, like, of course, they weren't completely left alone, we know how history works, but... For the most part, he was able to help them out of those kind of situations. 
Uh, his latest contribution is he founded a school for boys called the Hamilton Oneida School, which was named for the local Oneida people, as well as his friend, Alexander Hamilton. Uh, now, that college is to that children's school today has become uh, Hamilton College. What's really interesting, though, is it was trained, it was a school, an academy for both Native American and white children to learn at together which is pretty far ahead of its time for the late 18th century. So that's Samuel Kirkland, and we're going to end with Essex Hopkins before we do some trivia. Now, Essex Hopkins has a great first name, and I absolutely adore it. Anyway, Essex Hopkins is the first Commodore of the Continental Navy. Now, when I made the video the other day, someone left a comment he might be first flag officer. I'll be honest, as someone who's never served in the Navy, I hope my lingo is correct. If I'm not using the right parlance, I do apologize. I understand him to be a Commodore, though I did list him as Commander in the title of the article I published, I believe. Yes, Commander. So, I'm trying here. Essex Hopkins was uh, from Rhode Island. He was a really good ship. Uh, captain. He was a sea captain for decades leading up to the Revolutionary War, became well known for that. Uh, his brother, Stephen Hopkins, who would go on to sign the Declaration of Independence, was an on-again, off-again governor of Rhode Island. Hop Essex brother, Stephen Hopkins, and Samuel Ward, one would be Chief Justice, the other governor, and then they'd switch and switch and switch because they led different parties. Now, that's a fun story because it ends with them both getting together to go to the First Continental Congress and fighting for independence to get not literally fighting for independence. They went to the First and Second Continental Congress. Unfortunately, Ward passes away in March of 76, but, you know, a decades long rivalry put aside for the cause. Now, uh, Essex does help his brother when he's governor on several occasions. So he not only has ship seafaring experience, but he has political experience as well. Now, there's something I had, I must have overlooked when I first, I first wrote about Hopkins like three and a half years ago, right when I started Founder of the Day. And there was something I overlooked a bit, and I did include it in my video this week, though I breezed by it, and I really want to uh, get dig a little bit into the weeds on it, and that's the slave ship Sally. Hopkins in 1765 had never sailed a slave ship before. Uh... I do have to also like acknowledge that I am in no way condoning or apologizing for slavery in this conversation, and I certainly hope no one construes it as such. It's very dangerous to talk about slavery uh, when you're talking uh, about someone, especially when part of this story we talk about how great Hopkins does as a ship captain. We also need to talk about he had never piloted a slave ship. He was hired to captain a slave ship from Rhode Island to the West Indies. On the way there, he had, he left with 165 slaves. He arrives with less than 65. Because over 100 slaves had died in his care in a few, like a week and a half. No, it couldn't have been that short. Okay, I don't know enough about the trip. But Boston, you know, Rhode Island to the Caribbean shouldn't have been that long a trip. Perhaps he hit some weather. I don't know that much. Unfortunately, this whole ship full of slaves die, and the ones that are still alive are very, very sick. Uh, and in fact, it's an overall failure. Now, of course, today I don't like to note the value of slaves, but uh, because the slaves who did survive were so sick that they're, they he made essentially no profit. And the reason I bring this up is it's very difficult to he still succeeds he still has the trust of the people of rhode island when he returns despite this catastrophic attempt at, at being a slave trader uh, again i don't like to separate the slaves from the trading but to look at things through their eyes we have to acknowledge that they did um again as i said no way trying to apologize for or justify the, the practice of slavery. The, this particular trip was so bad, however, that it turned many people in Rhode Island against the idea of trading slaves. He did such a horrible job 
that people start saying maybe it's about time we start doing something. And from Rhode Island, it spread to New England. And I'll remind you, that's 1765. And within 20 years, Massachusetts has outlawed slavery. And Rhode Island and Connecticut and New Hampshire are not far behind. Uh, and it's Hopkins' great misfortune that, with the ship Sally, that leads to a lot of this. Now, again, now we have to carry on to the fun part of the story, like, uh, which is tough. It is a very tough transition. I, it took me like 20 attempts to shoot this week's video because it's a very tough transition. That being said, uh, Hopkins goes back. Over the ensuing years, his brother's governor one more time, and he works in politics there. He's still trusted as a ship captain, because although he was really bad at being a slave trader that one time he tried it, he had sailed around the entire world on many successful missions beforehand. In uh, late 1775, once the war is broken out, Essex Hopkins is then commissioned as a brigadier general in the state militia, and he is put in charge of all militiamen in Rhode Island. He only holds this position for a few weeks, however, because he is promoted, or not promoted, he's, the Continental Navy was created, and they needed someone to take charge. Now, Essex Hopkins was the choice of John Adams. I forget exactly who it was in the South. We spoke about it recently. It might have been Hart. It might have been Hart from, what was it, Georgia? No. Oh, it's going to eat at me. It was one of the Georgians, I believe, had a bunch of ships he donated to the cause. And he wanted John Paul Jones. Now, Adams didn't want John Paul Jones because... John Paul Jones' name was John Paul. He took on the Jones after he ran away from convictions from killing some of his own soul, uh, uh, you know, sailors. He ran to South Carolina and added the name Jones because Wiley Jones was very nice to him. So John Adams didn't necessarily trust John Paul Jones. Knowing what we know now, he might have been a better choice. But Essex Hopkins was actually chosen as commander of of the Continental Navy, the one and only person to be Commodore, as I understand it, of the Continental Navy. And one of his sons actually had a ship, uh, was it was an officer himself. The name is John Burroughs Hopkins. His son, John Burroughs Hopkins, also piloted a ship. Now, this is where things get a little tough for him, because Hopkins is told by the Continental Congress, dude, go to... The Chesapeake Bay. They're in Philadelphia. Just sail down to the Chesapeake Bay. Look at the British. We want you to attack the British. Now, if you can't attack the British, leave, go, do what you think will be helpful. But we'd really like it if you attack the British. Hopkins sailed down and looks at the British fleet and goes, Yeah, that's the British Navy. No, thank you. He rightfully assumed that if he were to attack the British Navy, he would be catastrophically eliminated from the battle, and that would be a horrifying way to start the Continental Navy. It would be a very quick end to the fledgling Continental Navy. So Hopkins decides to carry on down to the Caribbean. He attacks what we now know as Nassau, and what they at the time called uh, New Providence. Now this was very lightly guarded, and Hopkins easily took his target, and in fact, landed soldiers on the ground, which is the first time Marines from the United States ever landed on foreign soil. Though, this is a few months before independence was declared, but you get my meaning. So, first time U.S. Marines are landed on foreign soil. Then, they turn around and take the ammunition and gear and everything they had taken from the island. They want to bring it back to George Washington. So, they do. They turn around, they go up to sail up to Rhode Island. On the way, they pass Long Island, and they see a bunch of British ships, and they attack them, and they take two of the ships as prizes. Now, the real prize was a ship called Glasgow. That ship gets away, but they got more ships and more stuff for George Washington, and they pull into Rhode Island, and they unload it, and they send all this great stuff to George Washington, and then they kind of sit there for a while, and then... Hopkins is called to Philadelphia to defend himself because the Continental Congress says, hey, we told you to attack those British ships in the Chesapeake. And he's like, yeah, but we all would have been drowned. <laughs> it's pointless. Uh, and the British say, okay, well, 
you let the Glasgow get away. And he's like, yeah, but I caught two other ships and had ships full of stuff from the island I invaded. Uh, unfortunately, he is censured by the Continental Congress. Now, in hindsight, the Continental Congress probably should have simply fired him because that would have let them replace him with someone the soldiers trusted. But since he was censured, now the officers below him don't have a lot of respect for him, and it kind of sends the Navy into disarray. They, they basically sit around trapped in the harbor for about two years, or a year and a half, until finally giving up, and Hopkins eventually resigns. Now, they don't actually replace Hopkins with anyone else, because they look around and they say, well, John Paul Jones is at sea, Gustavus Cunningham is at sea, uh, Lambert Wicks is at sea. We can't even contact these people if we wanted to put them in charge. They're just out there doing their thing. So, Woods does not have anyone in charge for a while. And they basically did it until uh, the, the American Navy starts around, just uh, during the John Adams administration. Benjamin Stoddart starts the American Navy in 1798, I believe. And that's it. Those are the founders. Now, hi, I'm back. We are going to play trivia now. Uh, I'm sure people will start tuning in now because it's about 8.30. It's usually when people tune in. I'm going to take a quick hiatus. And I will be back in about three minutes to really get going. I'll be right back. not work there it is okay founder fans we are back who's ready for some trivia who 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 remember that song yeah uh troy saying it would be interesting to dig deep and find out why there was such a horrific death rate. that is true like i said um this was the story of essex hopkins was one i knew pretty well i wrote it very early on in founder of the day history and it's one of the ones i just kind of retained really well and then when I was looking in to write about him again, I was like, I, I can't believe I overlooked this. Because it's such important. It's because not just one, you know, unfortunately, many people ran slave ships. But this was a catastrophe by all accounts, even at the time. Uh, and it turned a lot of people against slavery in Rhode Island. So I did the research I could very quickly, but I actually did consider doing a whole nother article and episode just specifically about it. But... I will have to find it. I will find the time. Not now. Now we're playing trivia. So, let's get to it. Who's ready? Troy's here. Jeremy, you still here? Who else is here? Let me know you're here. We're playing some trivia. Now, while I fix my positioning here, we are... Oh, bit rate low. Great. Move me over. Who is the most likely author of the Cato essays? Now, again, Cato, we talked about this a little bit last week. Cato is an extremely important set of anti-federalist papers. Who is most likely the author? Like 90% chance the author. Most historians agree. There are a few people who don't. 
and they're fine. They have their reasons, and they're fine reasons. <laughs> Let's see who else is here. Not a lot of people for trivia this week, but it's uh, it's a different week. I mean, it's uh, yeah, it's a little different doing the the beginnings there. Ah, uh, Clinton, Troy, George Clinton is right. Who was the man who quote? Who was the quote man who merits public? Who can't read? Me, I'm the answer. Can't read. Who was the quote man who who merits the? I really can't get it out. Who was the man who merits the confidence of the public? Problem is, it says the too many times in that sentence. I actually noticed I got retweeted today by my friend Eileen, uh, and she quoted a sentence that I hadn't realized I wrote where I used the word should twice in a sentence. This just doesn't seem like good grammar. Who did Cato call the man who merits the confidence of the public? He was at the time warning, don't just accept the Constitution because you were handed it by a man who merits the public The man who merits the confidence of the public. I'm going with a three and a two and a one. No one's giving me an answer. Gray Wheels, welcome to the party. Gray Wheels, welcome to the party. Very close. But the answer, I'm afraid, is George Washington. Uh... Hamilton was, of course, writing the Federalist Papers and a big proponent of the Constitution he upgraded. Uh, but a lot of the Federalists uh, early on were saying, look, George Washington helped us. <laughs> Everyone was like, yeah, I mean, it's Washington. Okay, it's Washington, dude, yeah. Um, let's move right along here. Who was the first... Ch oh, man, I can't read today. Who was chairman for the first meeting of the New York Manumission Society. I'm gonna drink more of this coffee. I, it's, that's what I took a break to do before. <laughs> to like pound a half of this. I'll wake up as soon as we're done. Never fall asleep. It's gonna be hard going to soccer in the morning. Who was chairman for the first meeting of the New York State Manumission Society? Manumission, of course, is what they called abolition before they called it abolition. They called it manumission. Uh, the New York State Manumission Society. I will say, Gray Wheels, you said the name of the most famous person in the society. But we had done a little bit of a review beforehand, before we started trivia, where we spoke about some of the, the founders of the past week. And it is one of those people. Excuse me, coffee's getting to me. Troy, I'm waiting on you, man. <laughs> he listed the whole thing. Okay. Not, not the, not the audience we usually have for for trivia. It must be because this one side of my mustache keeps sticking up, and it's really bothering me, and it probably bothers you. <laughs> All right, a three, and two, and one, whammy. Robert Troop, Alexander Hamilton's college roommate, fifteen years later, helped him found the New York Manumission Society, and he was actually the person in who presided over the first meeting. He wasn't technically the first president. He was just the first person to preside over the meeting. Okay. What was the name of the militia Alexander Hamilton started when he was in college? They drilled on the lawn. This is the militia in the musical Hamilton. They say, let's go steal their cannons. This is the militia that did the stealing that Hamilton was a leader of. What was the name of that militia that stole those cannons? The drilled in the yard of King's College. Jeremy, sorry I'll participate now. Was listening on the way home from work. No worries. Thank you for listening. I appreciate that. You know what, Galloway? Uh, I was thinking about putting out, starting to put out just the audio and podcast form. Is that something? Is that something you'd be interested in? You think people would be interested in? I think my face distracts from my horrible voice. Oh, Troy, that's a great guess. You got the oaks part right. Uh, it's the hearts of oak. Sometimes it was called the hearts oak. Originally it was called the Corsicans. 
but I'll give it to you. I, I wish I don't have the image up. Maybe we'll look it up later. Uh, they had a hat. They had like a very particular hat they wore, which was cool, and I want one. Okay, the ambush of Geary had what effect on the British army? There it is. Oh, Grey Wheels. I'm sorry, I didn't see your answer. You popped in right when I did it. Yes, Grey Wheels got it. Nailed it. Yeah, I like YouTube too. Oh, do you pay for YouTube? I probably should at this point because I put out so much content, but I have yet to pay to subscribe to YouTube. Uh, I probably should because I watch so... You're right. I watch so much. It's all the TV I watch. It was some Netflix, I guess. Because they were called they were called the Corsicans. So they originally called themselves the Corsicans, which Corsica was a part of like um at the time Italy wasn't Italy, it was separate states. Same thing as Germany was kind of still the Holy Roman Empire, but they were basically separate nations, almost like the Americans considered themselves before the Constitution. They were essentially separate countries, kind of formally Italy. And there was a, uh, a Republican revolution in one of them by the Corsicans, if I'm remembering correctly, uh, not too long before the American Revolution. Okay, patrols were scared back. It petrified the British. Well, it did. It did. I wouldn't say petrified. Uh, Troy, Troy's right. They uh, became more cautious with their scouts. So, yeah, the patrols were scaled back. Is absolutely right. Which opened up, as we discussed, uh, the ability for Washington to cross the Delaware essentially unnoticed because with the ambush of Geary, the British were reigning in their patrols. Uh, I, I wouldn't say it petrified the British Army. It's very hard to get scared of the British Army. Cookie, no worries. We spent uh, some time reviewing. We did our weekend review ahead of time today. We're trying something new. Let me know if you liked it. Uh, instead of doing the weekend review yesterday, I was unable to. So we just reviewed last week and went right into questions that are pretty much about it. Um, um, my brother gets YouTube red for Christmas each year. Oh, that's a soup. That's a really nice gift. What a great brother. Uh, it's way better than what I get my brother. Okay, this one's a little off topic. We didn't cover this entirely today. We did cover some of it, though. Name the six nations of the Iroquois Confederacy. So the Iroquois Confederacy was actually known as the Five Nations until about 1772. So only about 40, 50 years before the revolution broke out did a sixth uh, Native American nation join the Iroquois Confederacy. And the Confederacy itself goes back way before the arrival of Columbus, if I'm understanding right. It technically goes into prehistory because they didn't have any written histories. I mean, Western you know, Europe had a long history by that point, but kind of in prehistory. Uh, really interesting, though they have fun stories that were passed down, not fun stories, important stories that were passed down through the generations that, again, I live in upstate New York where I'm right in the middle of it. I'm, my county is one of the correct answers right now. And they, um, there's a lot of places around here, lakes and counties that still bear the names uh, and, and like Hiawatha Boulevard and, and things of that nature. Um, Jeremy, I do the same with YouTube music videos. Yeah, I, yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, Gray Wheels getting one of them. Cayuga, absolutely right. Uh, Troy, Getting uh, Oneida Mohawk, uh, Oneida Mohawk Seneca, and Whammy. Uh, Gray Wheels coming in with Onondaga. Absolutely. And uh, Jeremy, yes, correct with Mohawk. Sure, I put them all in once, but that's okay. Uh, and that's right. Mohawk, Oneida, uh, which I spelled wrong. I caught myself. It's E before I. I know technically it's I before E and everything else. It's supposed to be E before I. Do not look at what I have on the screen. Uh, Onondaga. Cayuga, Seneca, and Tuscarora. Uh, funny story about Onondaga, that's the county I live in. Uh, once I, I moved here about a decade ago, and I went to get a driver's license, because mine expired almost right when I moved here, and I went up and I asked them how to spell, I spelled it wrong, and they, I, I learned at the DMV that it's pronounced Onondaga, not Onondaga. I was laughed at on several occasions, because I didn't know how to say where I lived. Um, uh, yes, and it's the, the Oneida and the Tuscarora are the ones that came in a little bit later. Uh, there's also Cayuga Lake and Seneca Lake. Mohawk River is a really important river through New York that the Erie Canal was later attached to. Uh, yada, yada, yada. I'm not going to talk too much about here because I, I, I feel like I'm bragging. Um, 
Yes, there are some. Yes, there are some good lacrosse players from up here for sure. Although, for my country, um, I forget what country you're in. Gray wheels. Are you in? Are you in Brazil? Are you in Brazil? Uh, next question. What gift was Polly Cooper given for helping the Patriots? Uh, Polly Cooper, we discussed about Native American woman who. Uh, I, I know Nida woman who came down, helped a, a bunch of men bring corn down, helped feed the Continental Army, stuck around to help heal wounded soldiers in, and sick soldiers in Valley Forge, uh, my county. Uh, yeah, we have a lacrosse up here. Truthfully, so I grew up down on Long Island. There's a lot of lacrosse on Long Island, which is surprising to a lot of people. Um, I mean, we're no Canada, you know? No John Tavares is coming from here. Which, hockey fans, the uncle of the hockey John Tavares is arguably the greatest lacrosse player of all time. Fun fact, hats off to my Canadian viewers, if there are any of you. You're welcome that I know that. <laughs> he was just in that Amazon show. Um, a shawl, yes, yes, a black shawl. That's right. She was given a black shawl. She didn't want any payment for helping the veterans and the soldiers at Valley Forge, uh, but some of the women she was with in town, she had noticed a black shawl she liked, and they bought it for her as a gift. That still is around. I think it's currently on display at the Smithsonian, though that might have changed at this point. What college did Samuel Kirkland found? Now, Samuel Kirkland, we discussed earlier, was uh, friendly with... Oh, I forgot to play the other game. Anyway, Samuel Kirkland, we discussed earlier, was friendly with uh, the Oneida and Tuscarora. He's the one who helped get them to side with the Patriots during the war. Um, Mr. Galloway uh, just lost a tremendous amount of respect for you. <laughs> we have a lot on Dallas Stars. We might not have ever had Mike Madano. I should say, I should add to that. I don't know. We've never had Mike Madano. <laughs> uh, and they did have, they didn't want a cup. All you had to do was kick it in, Galloway, and you want to stand the cup. So they kick it in on Dominic Hasek. That's the only way you could beat him. Anyway, enough hockey talk. We're here for the American Revolution. Uh, Troy coming out with the right answer. Hamilton College, originally called the Hamilton United School for Boys, uh, now a university. Which I the guys who made Super Troopers might have gone there. I can't remember if it was there or Colgate. I'm pretty sure. What are they? Broken Lizard? Is that what they call themselves? I think they are from there. Now, let's pop over to do a fun little thing. Sean Connery. Well, what's up? Moo to you, friend. Moo to you. How would you know my kid's first word? All right. I'm going to pop it. Okay, here it is. So, this is a fun little game we're going to play over on Sporkle before we get finish off the trivia. Had to rub it in. No, it's all right, man. It's all it's all fun and games. I'm just being silly. I'm a New York Hockey Rangers fan, so I've won one cup in 75 years. <laughs> yeah, you do have me there. Um, so this game, if I scroll up so you can read it, I had to zoom in kind of awkwardly. Can you name the 50 most populous cities located in U.S. states that gained statehood in the ninth in the 1790s? In hindsight, I'm just realizing that this... Oh, and I shouldn't have that there. Nope. Well, you know my trick. It's the same screen I shoot my read-alongs on. <laughs> okay. Um, not my best day. Not gray wheels. How dare you? <laughs> my younger brother was born a month after the New York Rangers won the Stanley Cup. And it was the second greatest thing that happened to me that year. <laughs> and I tell him that all the time. Okay. We can chat about hockey at the end. I, I, give, I could have started a whole channel on hockey, but it, there's people already doing it much better than I could. Um, now, I realize these are not the most populous cities in, 19, in the 1790s. These are the states that were admitted into the Union in the 1790s, but currently they're most populous cities. So I am going to hit play. You guys start naming cities. I will give you hints that, you know, there was maybe a Vermont, maybe a Kentucky and a Tennessee. I think that's it. I think we're just naming the most populous cities in those states 
Uh, it is eight minutes. I'm going to cut it down to four. I'm going to see what we do in four minutes. Yes, because no city had 600,000 people at the time. Okay, let's see. Charleston. Nope. Hey, Alexander, thanks for coming. Richmond. Oh, Richmond made the list. Don't know where it went, but it's on there. All right, Richmond, Kentucky, number 35. Well done, Alexander. Nashville. If I can spell it right. Yeah, let's move back over. There it is, number one. Baltimore. New York. So, uh, just to remind you, it's not the biggest cities in the country. It's just in the states that entered the Union in the 1790s. Uh, Boston. Franklin. Yes, Franklin, Tennessee. Boston, Philadelphia, oh, we got Nashville, Chattanooga is, if that's how you spell it, I don't know how to spell it, Nooga, let's see, what, oh, two T's, okay, uh, trying to rub my last two brain cells together, <laughs> uh, Philadelphia, is there a Philadelphia out there, nope, Northern Liberties, no, oh, that's a good guess, Troy, that, yeah, those are the those are just the generally the most populated city. I actually thought about doing that again. Montpelier. Is there two L's? Uh I would thought Montpelier, but I guess Vermont has like no populated cities. <laughs> there's one. I think there's just one right answer from Vermont. What we got here? How much time we got left? It won't show me how much time is left. Okay. Oh, okay. All right. Two more minutes. Two more minutes. We got Nashville. We got Nashville. It's right up top. Let's see. What would the name name a city in Tennessee that has a sports team? Knoxville. Actually, uh, Knoxville. Okay, Knoxville is a good answer. Actually, I don't know if there are any sports teams in the other city. Cleveland. Cleveland, Tennessee. Yes, Ohio had not yet entered the union. Knoxville. Did I do that? Yeah. Charlotte? Maybe. Nope. Cincinnati. Nope. Hired didn't enter the Union until, I think, 1802. All right. We're going to do a 3-2-1 and end it. I don't like this game. I'm sorry, guys. I thought I picked something better. Well, we're looking at Memphis, Louisville, Lexington. Oh, Providence, Rhode Island. That's a fun trick because Rhode Island didn't ratify the Constitution until uh, uh, 1790. So Rhode Island actually joined then too. And I'm actually kind of surprised that there's three cities in the top 13, four cities in the top 13, like bigger than Bowling Green. Interesting. I'll tell you what, we're going to do a better game. <laughs> we're going back. We're going to do the game we did a few weeks ago. And you know what? I'm sorry I'm over here. We're going to do the game we did a few weeks ago where we just named the biggest cities in 1790. Is that better? Is that better? Okay, I'm in the middle now. That was bugging me. So, let's try this again. We're going to name the biggest cities, the top 24 cities in the country in 1790 by the first based on the first u.s census yeah yeah starting over ready what was the biggest city most populated city in the country in 1790 with the first u.s census at 33,000? we're going back to the revolution back to the time period we like we have what do we have this one will be six minutes all right gray wheels boston it's probably number two yep Number three, New York City. Right, I got to spill it out. New York City was number one. It had not been when the revolution started, but it's skyrocketed in population. Troy, Northern Liberties. Yes, now a part of Philadelphia was then biggest. Philadelphia. I gave it away, and uh, Gray Wheels said Philly. Yes, largest in population, Galloway. So most populated. New York, we just got in there. Might be some other places in New York. I don't know. Maybe. 
uh, Maryland, uh, Maryland's a whole state. We're looking for just the uh, cities. Baltimore would be there. Yes, pretty big. This one, I believe, is in South Carolina, number four. Hint, hint, wink, wink, nudge, nudge. All right, coffee's kicking in. Now I'm getting all antsy. Ooh, Providence. Yes, way to pay attention to the answers from before. Providence. Made my way from Providence to Phoenix. I was just playing a song today with um, a Vampire Weekend song, Men's Providence. Okay. Ooh, Troy. Marblehead. Yes, it's way up there. Charlotte. Not yet. It was a city. Well, it was a town then. It was, it was not very big. Charleston. Yes. Number four. Absolutely. Good job, Cookie. Uh, Charlotte was close, Jeremy. Um, yeah, Charlotte would have been North Carolina then. It would still be North Carolina today, now that I say it out <laughs> Okay. Um, let's see. We're definitely going to have at least, I think there's going to be at least one more in New York. Uh, a few more in Boston. I was going to say Newport, Rhode Island. Absolutely, it's up there. Uh, Connecticut, think Connecticut. If you can figure out, if you can remember any city in Connecticut, it's probably going to be on this list. Yeah, so Charleston was like an, an area. I don't even know if it counted as a village, but th there was a battle there. I forget the name of the battle. Uh, and I can't remember, believe I'm forgetting the name of the guy who led the battle. Uh, something, something, something. It was a three name name. And uh, they were, I think it was Bannister Charleston said they were like, a, it was like a hornet's nest. And that's why there's the Charlotte Hornets and everything. Uh, Cookie, we got Boston up there already. It's it's correct answer. It's number three. Oh, and uh, it's hard for you guys to see. I know it's hard for you guys to read. It's really small. Um, but yes, that's correct answer. Richard Henry Davy? No. William Davy something? Uh, oof. Southwark with an E. With an A. <laughs> I tried three different vowels there for you, Troy. We got it. We got it. I will give you that. Uh, Southwark, PA. Okay, it's not even Massachusetts. Yeah, no, that's okay, Cookie. I know. It's it's really small for you guys. I'm sorry. But I wanted to see if I could keep it over here. Uh, well, you know what? Is that better? Not really. I tried. Oh, and now it's like impossible for me to use. Okay, back down. <laughs> Let's see. Newark. Good guess. Good guess, Greg. It was Crockett. That's a fun guess. Portsmouth, New Hampshire. Yes, sir. Going to make the list. Um, we are thinking, oh, two and a half minutes. There it is. New Haven. There's one. You know the capital of Connecticut? Or the town... Oh, Salem is probably a correct answer. Number seven. Good job, Galloway. Uh, let's see. Let's see. Let's get number 12 in here. Oh, Gloucester. Yes, number 12. All right, we got the top 12. What's over here? These are much smaller. They go from less than 5,000. Uh, Taunton? Did you mean Trenton? Well, that's wrong anyway. Oh, <laughs> Princeton? Are you going there? Nope. Don't even worry about it. <laughs> Doesn't work. All right. Uh, yeah. Let's see. What else? I'm racking my brains right now. Uh, oh, Georgia. There was a city in Georgia that got uh, invaded during the American Revolution. There was also a... Uh... Man, I'm drawing blanks too, guys. I am drawing some blanks. Lancaster, good answer. No, good answer though. If anything, it would probably be something in Berks County. No, because even Allentown had just been created by William Allen a few years beforehand. So what's tough about back then is like most of the cities and towns on the East Coast that like we would think of populated today were just being founded with a couple families. My high school, yeah, my high school. I, I yes. Mine too. I graduated with the population about this. In fact, the small, the town I came from isn't even that big, and it would be the third biggest on this list. 
and it's like the suburbs of New York City. Atlanta. No, Atlanta wasn't much yet, but there's one on the coast in Georgia. It's supposed to be really nice. Williamsburg, yes, with an E. Uh, what about the capital of Virginia? Oh, Alexandria. That's a good guess. Yes, Alexandria, Virginia. What about the current capital of Virginia? I'm actually surprised. Uh, Savannah, yeah, that's what I was going for. And it doesn't even make the list, so I shouldn't have been giving you those hints. Uh, uh, the current capital. Oh, and time's up. Okay. We did really good. What did we get? 15 out of 24. It's pretty good. Uh, we missed Newburyport, Massachusetts. Sherburne, which is now Nantucket, Massachusetts. Middleborough, Massachusetts. Richmond, Virginia. That's the one I was hitting at. Albany, New York is a big focus of tomorrow's founder. Uh, Norfolk, Virginia, which burned and it still got back. Petersburg, Hartford, Connecticut. I was also trying to hint at as the capital. And Hudson, New York. It's interesting, too, because we have Hartford, Richmond, uh, Providence, Baltimore, Boston are all still the capitals of those states. Uh, okay, great. Well, that's fun. Why don't we pop back over here? We'll do our last few questions. That's not it. That's just me. What's up? Let's pop back over here. Uh, we'll do our last few questions, and we'll see where how we feel from there. Okay. Who was the first commander of the Continental Navy? And now I'm moved over too much here. Great, so I got to fix that. Hello. <laughs> so what was the combined census for these cities? Uh, you know what? That's a fun question. I'll bring out my calculator on my phone. And we will figure that out while you guys answer this question. Got a calculator. All right, New York, 33,000. 33,131 plus 28,522 plus 18,320 plus 16,359 plus 13503 plus 9913 plus uh, let's say 7000 plus 6000 okay let's say 20 15 16 Say seventeen thousand. Oh, 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 oh. Oh, did I mess it up? How do I go back? Why did my calculator change? Plus seventeen thousand. Uh, oh. Twenty. Twenty. Plus. 24,000, say, 7, 10, 13, 15 and a half, 18, 20, 26, ah, What am I doing here? Okay, I got it, I got it. Plus 26 equals, okay, okay. Well, that was horrible content, me just staring at my phone. Uh, 202,259, so about 202,000 people. Now that's interesting, and we're side noting here. That's very interesting because at the time, estimates vary, <laughs> I am sorry. At the t that was a good guess. At the time, estimates vary, but there was probably, at the beginning of the revolution, about 2.5 million people, about 500,000 of which were slaves, that 0.5. Now, when certain when they're doing the ratification debates, that number has increased dramatically, and uh, one of the, I think it was Brutus, says, it says on a few occasions that it's probably 3 or 4 million people living at the time. So even if we are cautious in our estimation and say uh, 300,000 people, 
I'm, I'm sorry, 3 million people, 200,000 is less than 10% of the population. Most people were farmers. Most people were farmers throughout human history, including the American Revolution, that only starts to change really during the George Washington administration as in the Industrial Revolution sets in. So, uh, yes, yeah, Troy, largely rural. Do I look like extra tired? Really? You guys keep saying that. I am tired, but I'm drinking a whole coffee and now I got the jitters. <laughs> I'm ready to go. I'm a night person too. That's why we're doing this late at night. Um, also, I can't do the colors right and it like makes my eyes look, I don't know why. You'd think I would have figured it out by now. I try something different every single day to make the colors look better. <laughs> I can't. Maybe it's because I wore uh, my new sweater and, and it looks like pajamas <laughs> instead of my usual collar. Um, let's see. So. Oh, yeah. Essex Hopkins <laughs> is the answer. You're right. Essex Hopkins. Let's do this. Last question of the night. Essex brother Stephen was most famous for what? Okay, well, I'm sorry I'm freaking you out, guys. My horrible face. <laughs> uh, I can make... This is... You want to see my... You want to see my tired faces? Does this look... Does this look more tired? No. No, that looks like I have a tummy ache. Uh, it's like Jim Brewer says. I can't. I can't help that I look this way. <laughs> Okie dokie. I'm waiting on it. I want to know what Stephen Hopkins is most famous for, and not just what he did, but I'd like to know what he said. And you can go to my merch store and buy a shirt with his name and his saying on it, because it is one of the best lines. Of the American Revolution. Excuse me. Did you, did, it, did you try changing the room? Like, yeah. So I have. I can't move my camera because it's a webcam. I, I need to get like a real video camera. I have a whole bunch of lights here. Some of which are on sometimes. And some of which are not. <laughs> None of them are like legit lighting. But I have all sorts of extra like, I have a cloth here. I don't know if I can... It'll probably make me look... Yeah, see how I got brighter? I keep this cloth over one of the lights. As well as, like, one of those Chinese lanterns. To, like, dim it a little bit so it's not directly on me. I have friends who, like, shoot movies who have given me all these tips. And I just can't figure it out. Uh, beer. I've stumped you, Troy. Everyone. Guys. Guys. Stephen Hopkins signed the Declaration of Independence. As I said before, and he had the phrase, my hand trembles, but my heart does not. There it is. You got it after I, I, you got it. I'm ahead of you, Troy. So you got it. Yes. Stephen Hopkins had palsy. His hands would literally, would just always shake. And when he signed the declaration, if you look at a copy of the declaration, his is the super sh shaky one where you're like, what's wrong with that dude? Well, he had palsy and his hand was shaking. Uh, and he actually says, cause he's writing it. And he looks up at William Ellery across the table and says, my hand trembles, but my heart does not. Uh, meaning, I'm stricken with an ailment, but I certainly am not afraid to be hung, which he was most certainly going to get hung. <laughs> uh, but he was already, yeah, it's one of my favorites. It's one of the few quotes I put on a shirt. Uh, I have it somewhere around here one of my own you can go to the website and purchase one if you like uh and it's on a coffee cup too which is downstairs uh yeah it is one of the best phrases and, and as i said before stephen hopkins was really interesting because for a long time he was a leader of rhode island and so was stephen ward uh, uh samuel ward and they were the leaders of opposite parties in rhode island politics and one would be governor while the other was chief justice and then they'd switch and switch and switch and then they both, after decades of being leaders of opposition parties, put their differences aside and go together as leaders of Rhode Island to the First Continental Congress. And then they go back to the Second Continental Congress, where they, uh, they're they both supporters of independence, but 
St Samuel Ward dies of, I think, yellow fever while he's in Philadelphia. And he's replaced by William Ellery. And so when Hopkins signs the Declaration of Independence, just a, a, three or four months later, it's not just really signing for him. He's signing for him and his long, lifelong enemy, who also was in agreement finally for the first time in their lives on independence. Ah, uh, this one badass phrase, steadfast, true. Yes. Troy, uh, yeah, well, I'm about to send out, for everyone who's on Patreon, uh, I'm about to send out uh, this weekend uh, discount codes for uh, anyone who supports the channel on Patreon. If you guys have a few bucks a month, you want to throw this way, help me offset the cost, I assure you I'm not making any money. I've lost a significant amount of money on Founder of the Day over the last three and a half years. So if you guys want to help me uh, keep the lights, keep the shitty lights on. Sorry, bad language. Uh, keep the crappy lights I have on. Help me out. Uh, Troy, I am going to, uh, don't, if you want to buy it, hold off uh, tomorrow, maybe Sunday, because i got a busy day tomorrow. I'm going to send out new discount codes for uh, everyone on Patreon uh, to basically get the merch at cost. <laughs> uh, don't don't worry about that. Um, uh, were, were they full brothers? Weird to have a unique name and common name siblings. I guess, I'm guessing, guessing Essek was named after Grandpa or something or other. Um, yeah, they were legitimate brothers. They were the Hopkins brothers. Essek Hopkins, Samuel Hopkins. Um, is Essek a biblical name? I, I guess I don't, I, you know, not, I read more about the 18th century than I read the Bible, I'll be quite frankly with everyone. I read more about the 18th century than anything. <laughs> uh, it is a really unique name. I've rarely heard it. You know what name? I, I There are two guys from the American Revolution with the first name Tench. T-E-N-C-H. Tench Cokes and Tench Tillman, who both played really interesting parts. I tried to get my spouse to name one of my kids Tench. She was not having it. Uh, she said it makes her... Reminds her of throwing up, I guess, wrench or wretch. Uh, I, don't, I I like the name Tench. Name your kids Tench. All of them. Um, uh, why was he getting hung again? Oh, so, uh, sorry, Cookie. He was, like, I. Uh, when they signed the Declaration of Independence, they were essentially signing their death warrant. They were ready to go. Uh, if they got caught, they should have been hung for treason. They were committing treason, according to British law, and they should have been hung for treason. Now, several of them were caught during the war, but were not hung for treason. Uh, that was already pretty late in the war, and the British, the British who were actually leading the war, as opposed to the king and parliament and and secretaries, ministers back in England, uh, the people who were actually overseeing the war wanted to win the war, but then have the people welcome them back, and that's why they weren't so anxious to hang them, but. Um, well, it's like George, Ben Franklin has that famous saying, uh, we'll all hang together, or most assuredly, we will all hang separately. Which I always thought was a funny quote because they use the term hang, like hang out, we gotta hang together, and I thought that was more of a new term, but I guess not. Ezekiel. Oh. I think his name was Ezekiel. I've never, that's a good point, Jeremy. Uh. I believe it's biblical, but maybe shortened. Like, Jeremy is Jeremiah. Oh, okay. Okay. That makes a lot of sense. But I don't know. <laughs> okay, guys. Well, we've gotten through the trivia. Uh, unless you guys want to do... That's the origin of hanging. I don't know. Ben Franklin always has good quotes like that. Because he's got the one after the Declaration... After the Constitution, too. Uh, George Washington had uh, a half of a son on the back of his chair. And uh, he, Franklin famously says, uh, well, first of all, what, Franklin, what did you give us? A republic, if you can keep it. Although there's questionable if that's true. But he did say, um, I've stared at the, I guess I'll paraphrase, I don't remember the exact quote, but I've stared at the sun on Washington's chair all summer long. And I wondered if it was a rising or a setting sun. Uh, I now believe it is a rising sun. Uh, that was his support of the Constitution. It's interesting, too, we, we were mentioning earlier how, and this just occurred to me, uh, the, the, many of the Federalists were saying, look, George Washington helped write this Constitution. You should want it. 
But you don't really hear them saying, hey, Ben Franklin was there too. Which is strange. I guess Franklin was too quirky a character for people to really care about his opinion. <laughs> Oh, all right, guys. Well, I think that's going to do it for the night. Uh, Franklin was a genius. I believe, believe it came from him. Makes perfect sense in a terrible way. Uh, Franklin was fun. I will say that. He dropped He dropped on my list of top 100 this year. Number... Wait, he dropped a four? Did I drop him to four? Oh, sorry, Benny. Sorry, Benny. You should have lived longer. <laughs> All right, guys, I think that is it for me tonight. Now, we've been doing these Federalist read-alongs, and I really want to do Federalist number 10 soon. I was thinking about doing this weekend, but I might hold off until next week. I want to kind of hype it up because I think there's a lot of people who aren't interested in every Federalist that might really want to hear Federalist number 10. It's one of the most important ones. Uh, so probably Monday I'll be doing that. I also want to note that we uh, are... I've been working on this other piece of software to start shooting my videos on there, which I think will make trivia and pretty much everything a lot more fun. I'm figuring out how to use a chat bot to add stuff in here. There might be the ability, I might be able to put in like some automated games that you could play between each other while we're doing trivia. Again, I'm not a computer whiz, so it's taking me a long time to figure that out. Uh, it's actually the difficult part for me is figuring out what you would see on your end. So. Uh, I've been working on it for a few weeks, but I'm hoping to unveil it next week. I think it's going to be super sweet, and you'll really, really enjoy it. Uh, who is better than Franklin? Uh, Washington's number one. This year, it was Jefferson at two, John Adams at number three. Uh, actually, no, forget what I said. Go watch my Top 100 Founders video. Take three hours of your life to get through it. Nah, that's the top. You're number 10 all your time. Oh, <laughs> no problem on number 10. Oh, I thought you were saying I'm number 10. I was like, I'd like to know who your top nine favorite uh, YouTubers are. <laughs> cool. Yeah, uh, probably on Monday. Uh, it's going to be a lot of fun. Troy, you've been watching them. I, I think they're a lot of fun. I know they're not for everyone. I don't get a lot of people watching them, actually, uh, which I want to appeal to the what you guys want more than anything. But I've learned so much saying them out loud and reciting them that I can't stop now. I need to fin I need to get through all 83. I'm going to blast through them as quick as I can. Uh, I probably will pop them up randomly, but number 10, I won't. I'm going to have to hype up number 10, like number 51. There are a few out there that are really important that I, I can't just like surprise you with. Uh, but, oh, I'm also, uh, I think next Saturday, going to do another a top 20 list. They are interesting to Revner's Troy, right? I did that top 100 founders thing. You guys really liked it. So I'm going to start doing top 20 lists like once a month I had mentioned. I'm going to do one this, not tomorrow, but a week from Saturday. I'm going to do another one. Uh, I think it's going to be fun. I don't exactly know what I'm going to call it yet, but I do know what the topic's going to be. So look forward to that. Uh, yeah, I'll, Troy, uh, that's a good point, Galway. I'm going to try and start scheduling them out uh, much earlier in the week. I do release a schedule. If you follow me on... Uh, uh, Instagram, I've been putting a schedule there and in my emails and on the Discord channel, if you guys are on there. Although, not a lot of people like use the Discord that much. Truthfully, I've been invited to a few Discords and it's not all I'd hoped it would be. Uh, it gets kind of like messy in there, uh, especially on the app on my phone. So, if you guys have other forms of communication you like, let me know. There's a lot more we can really do on YouTube, especially once I hit that 4,000 hour mark. I have 5,000 hours of watch time. I'm averaging 350 hours a month, which I need 333 a month for a whole year to hit 4,000 hours in a 12-month period, and then YouTube unlocks for me. And I can not only monetize it, which would be nice, but I can uh, offer you guys like a lot more stuff within YouTube. So, I mean, keep watching. You guys, you guys are already watching. You're doing your part. Uh, but once that happens, I, we can like use the community tab a lot better here, which would be ideal. Um, did any of the founding fathers have a preferred weapon? Uh, Washington, I think, wore a saber. That was part of standard uniform at the time. And I know a lot of people who did heroic things during the war were gifted a saber uh, as a thank you for their actions, not just in the Revolutionary War, but in previous wars also. Um, I know Daniel Morgan and his riflemen sure like their rifles. 
Uh, but, but yeah, Galloway, uh, if you want to follow me on, if you do Instagram, follow me on Instagram because I put up my daily articles. Well, you can't do links on Instagram, which stinks, so I don't really put up the articles. I just put up the image and a quick blurb about the founder of the day. Uh, but every Monday I put out, like, my projected schedule. Those are subject to change because life, and it's just me over here. <laughs> Uh, but that being said, thank you guys so much for watching. It is just me over here, and you guys watching and hanging out like this makes it worth my time. If no one was watching, it would absolutely not be worth my time. So between you guys, and I put out the founders every day, the short videos, uh, though I get a lot of one-off views on those, uh, I'll have people say, hey, this is my ancestor. Like once a day at this point, I get someone leave me a comment and say, this is my ancestor. Thanks for the video. Because they're super random and you're the only person on the internet who's covered them <laughs> which is my niche little super extremely random people that no one else has even heard of i make very short youtube videos about uh tomorrow goose van shake <laughs> look out for him um i don't know why but i sound familiar probably because you've been watching my videos for a while now and you've grown accustomed to my uh scary voice uh Troy, the ancestor thing is super cool. You know what the coolest thing is? I, there are two or three founders now. I think one's Roger Sherman. Uh, one might be John Dickinson. Guys I did years ago who several people have said they're my founder. And then other people have re-commented and been like, oh, we're cousins. Like, I guess we're cousins. Now these people are like a country away from each other and, you know, a hundred times removed. But they've briefly found each other in the comment section on Founder of the Day. And it is the, the coolest thing. Now. It is just the coolest thing. Uh, ben also drawn like sabers. Adam had dueling pistols. A lot of people had dueling pistols. Uh, Alexander Hamilton was killed with the same set of dueling pistols his son was. That might not be true. That might not be true. Uh, John Barker Church, Adam's brother-in-law, who married Angelica Schuyler, which, by the way, the musical Hamilton, uh, Angelica Schuyler has a line where she says, uh, I've met a wealthy husband. He's not a lot of fun. Uh, that's not true. He was living under an assumed name when they met, and he was auditing her father, and then they ran away to France, uh, where they could live under their real name. He was under an assumed name because he was running for debts. <laughs> Thank you so much, Scott. Thank you so much for hanging out. I really appreciate it. Uh, next time, answer some questions, man. <laughs> uh, but yes, uh, he had a set of dueling pistols that Hamilton used in his duel. I don't remember if it's the same set that Philip Hamilton used when he was killed in a duel but I think Aaron Burr might have borrowed them in a different duel. Or no, Burr was going to duel with Church. I got to look back into it. But John John Barker Church was involved with a bunch of duels with the Hamilton family. And he was on the Schuyler family side, of course. Um, I am the 23 and me of the American Revolution. Uh, I think Ancestry.com is the 23 and me of the Revolution. <laughs> oh, that's so funny. I'm hilarious. Uh, yeah. Uh, Unless you guys have any more questions, I mean, I'm happy to hang out and answer questions as long as you want. This is fun for me. Um, this is why I put all the research in. No, actually, put the research in for selfish purposes, but uh, the reason I made Founder of the Day is so I'm not selfish. I don't know the answers. Well, I enjoy learning it, too. That's part of the fun and trivia. Well, what do you think, guys? Uh, I did the week in review just beforehand leading up to it, kind of. Do you like that so we can talk about it, learn it, and then kind of quiz ourselves to help reinforce our memory afterwards? Uh, or would you prefer me to ask more questions that are not related? Or you want me to continue? I plan on going back and doing the Week in Review on Thursday nights, but if you'd prefer I lump them together like this, I mean, it's only, what, an hour and a half has been the whole caboodle here. So we could do that. That could be our Friday night thing every time we do trivia. Uh, let me know in the comments. Uh, I... You know, like I said, I want to make this as accommodating for you guys as possible. I want you guys to learn what you're interested in and make it as engaging as possible, especially with the Federalist read-alongs that everyone's not super engaged with. 
but I am going to continue to continue to do for myself and because I know leaving the Federalist Reviews online in the future, a year, five years, ten years from now, there will be students who find it and they will be helpful. Some student is going to have to review Federalist number nine, which is a pointless Federalist where Hamilton is way off base and they're going to watch me tell them that. <laughs> and hopefully uh, they don't just assume that all the Federalists are great because they're not all great. All right, Troy, thank you so much, bud. I think it's great that, great that dwelling was such an acceptable thing, dueling was such an acceptable thing. People carry pistols. Uh, yeah, they didn't really carry their dueling pistols around necessarily, but yeah, they were they had their dueling pistols. Who's my favorite continental general or leader? Interesting question. Uh, Morgan was the man, yeah. Uh, who's my favorite? Well, uh, let me read what Galloway said real quick. Je uh, Scott, half what I answered is a guess. Yeah, guess, guess wrong. Who cares? It's all fun here. That's why we're learning. Yeah, I know what you meant, Galway. Uh, gray, gray wheels. Um, who's my favorite? So, like, that changes all the time. Based on who I'm reading. Uh, when it comes to leaders, Roger Sherman has a special place in my heart. He's one of the guys that got me interested, you know, when I was in, I was in a class 20 years ago. And I was told to write about someone who, you know, not the big six. Like, they, the teacher said... Uh, don't choose Washington, Madison, Hamilton, Jefferson, Franklin, Adams. Choose someone else and write about them. Uh, and I had gone and I looked at the Declaration. I was like, okay, look at all these names. Who's on here? And I'm like, okay, let's look at the Constitution. And I compared the Constitution, the names on the Constitution and the Declaration. And a few of them were the same. So then I looked at the Articles of Confederation. And a few of them were the same. And then I actually went back and looked at the Continental Association that instituted the boycott after the First Continental Congress. And one of them was the same. And it was Roger Sherman. And this one guy signed all four documents. He's there the whole time. And I had to learn about that guy. And yeah, uh, and so he has a special place in my heart. Um, yeah, Scott, not only are there other streams, definitely subscribe and hit the notification bell because I put out a different video every morning about the American founders. So if you don't, you know, instead of watching the weekly wrap up, I do, you know, they're just super quick. Try and keep them under five minutes. Sometimes they go up to almost 10, but uh, every morning. If that interests you. Uh, but yeah, so Roger Sherman, actually, when I graduated, I don't have it immediately available. When I graduated college, my parents gave me uh, uh, Roger Sherman's autograph was my graduation present, uh, which I still hang on to and is extremely valuable to me. Uh, between him and then Governor, Governor Morris, who was the one-legged ladies man of the revolution, uh, who wrote the words, uh, we the people, on the Constitution. He actually drafted the whole constitution uh he also has a very special place in my heart because he's a lot of fun too that's a guy who's a lot of fun uh would still be uh just had illustrious affairs his whole life and then died um clearing a kidney stone out of his urethra with a sharpened whalebone use your imagination uh uh cookie who's my favorite so like those are two highlights i really like silas dean just because his story is fascinating and he's super underappreciated. Uh, as far as generals, so I was never really into the military history. I, I was never really into military history at all uh, until about when I started Founder of the Day. I said, okay, I need to learn this better if I'm going to be talking about it because people might ask me who my favorite, <laughs> you know, about the war. So I did, I have put, except, you know, extra study into that over the years. Um... And I just did, generally speaking, with Michael Troy, the interviews, I, we just finished putting them out on Wednesdays. I think we did like 12 of them, hour-long discussions of the 20, I think, seven major generals of the Continental Army. Uh, he's not my favorite, but Benedict Arnold is a lot of fun to learn about uh, because he was so important. He was like the patriot. Uh, it's why his treason was so important. Is He was like the guy that the rank-file soldiers looked up to. So he's a ton of fun. Uh, everyone, you know, uh, Christian Despinia would be very angry if I didn't point out uh, Dr. Joseph Warren, as would Spencer Van Herrick, uh, who's a uh, portrayer of Joseph Warren. Uh, my favorite, man. Uh, my favorite, uh, generals. Um, you know, I grew up on Long Island, and I so I'm partial to down there. Believe it or not, you know, judge what you will. I know. A lot of my conservative audience probably doesn't love it out there. <laughs> um, 
Now, you know what's really fun about this channel too is I found that my can my audience you guys are pretty much divided half and half between liberal and conservative. I uh, and I, first of all. I think that's because I don't talk about modern politics. I try not to talk about it at all. Comes out a little bit talking about the Federalists. It's hard not to, uh, but uh, yeah, it, it means a lot that we. I, I have never seen someone talking trash about modern politics in this channel. I'm sure if I, you know, if the channel grows, that will happen, and we'll put a stop to it. Um, but uh, coming from Long Island, uh, 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 what's his name? Uh, Holden, Samuel Holden Parsons, although he's from Connecticut, uh, he invaded Long Island a few times on behalf of the Patriots, uh, and William Floyd. I used to give tours of the William Floyd estate. Floyd is a signer of the Declaration, more known as a boardroom guy, but he was, uh, uh, I think, a brigadier general in the county militia, uh, and he was part of... Eastern Long Island was a terrifying no-man's land during the Revolutionary War. They kind of get to it a little bit in the show Turn, but not everyone lived in a small town. That small town was one of the big towns of Setauket at the time. So, uh, I didn't realize there were, um, yep, uh, uh, that's rough. Uh, was he able to get the whole bone cleared with the kidney stone? Uh, no, it got infected and he died from the um, wiener out. I don't know how to say it. <laughs> um, yeah, uh Galloway, if there's one book, it's a super easy read. It's the book, one, the real book that got me into the American Revolution. There are two books that got me in. Founding Brothers is a must read by Joseph J. Ellis. It's super easy. It tells six stories of the most important events. Uh, then And then uh, there's um, uh, The Rake Who Wrote the Con Gentleman Revolutionary, The Rake Who Wrote the Constitution is about Gouverneur Morris by my favorite author, author Richard Brookheiser, who retweeted me recently when I said that without this particular book, there would be no founder of the day. And that, you know, my heart melted that I, he actually retweeted me. Um, uh, that's an easy read, and he is so much fun. He's not like the rest of these nerdy gentlemen running the Revolutionary War. He's like, goes to France, and is just hanging out with married women, and comes back to America, and is just hanging out with married women, and all this and that. And, you know, writing the Constitution. Oh, and also, he was number two to Robert Morris, unrelated, in funding the Revolutionary War. Uh, he also lost his leg during the war, uh, and despite what you may have heard, he got his leg caught in a carriage, and it got torn off. They had to amputate it, and there was no anesthetic. So, like, it's a fun story. <laughs> Excuse me. Grey Wheels. Oh, you're from Long Island. Oh, that's right, because you said county before, not country. Uh, you're from Western County. Like, Nassau? <laughs> um... Uh, that's because modern politics is trash. Yeah, like I said, I don't really like to talk about modern politics on here. I don't want to divide people. I will say that if there's one channel I recommend everyone watch, if you are interested in modern politics, um, there's a show called Breaking Points. It's on YouTube. Check it out. There, um, it's two people. One's a little bit liberal and one's a little bit conservative, and they agree on most things because most Americans, I don't, I don't want to talk about modern politics. I will say most Americans actually agree on most things, despite what the TV and social media tell you. You know, we all drive on the right hand side of the road. We all hold the door for people behind us. We all say please and thank you. We all hope to live in a polite society. So, um, the, 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 there's about 10% of conservatives and about 10% of liberals with the loudest voices that make the biggest stink. But most of us, most of us are just regular people, and we all agree that what's happening in Washington D.C. is garbage. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and that's all you're going to get from me. Uh, infected urethra. Yeah, let's not talk about it. Uh, also, before you end the stream, could you tell me your favorite color? Because you're making me a gift. Oh, uh, blue. <laughs> I like navy blue. Uh, dark navy, yes. Um, What's the book and what stories? Uh, the book... Uh, oh, okay, the book with the stories is... It's called Founding Brothers by Joseph J. Ellis. Um, I will grab it for you. You guys want book recommendations? I was actually thinking about doing a video where I like talk about one shelf at a time. This needs to go. This is a dictionary from 1957. I got from my Don't Tell Him uh, father because it's uh, the year he was born. Uh, 
and words are wrong back then. <laughs> um, uh, where is it? Where is it? Oh, I know it's here. I know it's here because I pulled it out before. No. Well, let me know if you'd like me to go through my books here and offer reviews. Um, where is the room? Where are you? I thought you were right here. Okay. Well, there's a picture. Well, it bugs me. So there's a picture on the front of... Oh, there's my butt. Okay. <laughs> I'm sorry about my butt. Um... <laughs> There's a there's like six pictures on the front. It's like Washington, Adams, Jefferson, Franklin, Hamilton, Madison. Uh, it it usually goes chronologically, but it starts with the duel between Burr and Hamilton. Uh, then it talks about the room where it happens, like they have they talk about in the play. Uh, it talks about the truth of that, uh, or what we know about it actually. Um, let me focus up here, uh, and uh, a few other like just really important moments of the American founding. Uh, plus one of the books. So the book is called Founding Brothers. And and the title itself kind of opened me up to the founders. Instead of just the founding fathers, you will very rarely hear me use the term founding fathers because it implies there's like six people and there's not. There's hundreds. Um, founding Brothers by Elway by uh, Joseph J. Ellis. E-L-L-I-S. Uh, then there's the, the Rake Who Wrote the Constitution uh, by Governor Morris. Uh, I Gray, I can give you a bunch of books. Um, uh, yeah, let's change topic. Yeah, that's right. Uh, uh, that's about Governor Morris. Uh, there's also Unlikely Allies is a little bit more of a challenging read, but it's about Silas Dean and how he worked with a playwright and a cross-dresser in France to blackmail essentially the king of france to get him to support the american revolutionary war it's one of the reasons silas dean is is such an underrated founder you hear me bring up his name all the time this dude went to france in secret communicating just basically with benjamin franklin and worked for a fake company under the uh which was owned by john asop in new york or alsop in new york who, by the way, refused to vote for independence and left the Constitutional Convention, but he was still the guy essentially overseeing the importation uh, of, from a shell company of the arms that would win the Battle of Saratoga. And when Silas Dean returns to the United States, he is in the headship of, with the might of the French Navy. To one side is the first French and any ambassador to the United States from another country, and on the other side is the Commodore, the Admiral of the French Navy. He brings the French Navy home and is almost immediately put on trial. I say almost because they made him wait around for a year. Meanwhile, his kids, Jesse's over in France still, or the Netherlands, going to college with John, going to grade school with John Quincy Adams. It's an amazing story. Unlikely Allies is my favorite book. So, yes, Founding Brothers Joseph J. Ellis. Uh, who cross-dressed in France. Um, so it was a Frenchman. He went there and worked with two Frenchmen. And one guy, uh, Bar-Marche- Bar-Marche, I think it's pronounced, was helping him run the guns. And then De Eon, uh, the Chevalier De Eon, had very effeminate features. Uh, you go buy the book and read it for yourself. But I would, I'm not going to spoil uh, spoil it for you, but grew up as a man and then was sent by the king to Russia to help teach Catherine the Great, before she was known as the Great, uh, French, and dressed as a woman because the Russians wouldn't let a French man into the royal palace and was essentially a spy. Goes back to France, gets some promotions, ends up going to England, but then... For various reasons, loses the trust of the king, and then seems to have a little bit of mental health problems, which is why he loses the trust of the king. But then, and I'm not associating mental health problems with this, ends up, you know, being accused of being a woman, and then tries to fight, duel some people, because he wasn't a woman, and then eventually is permitted to come back to France by the king, but only if she dresses as a woman, and lives as a woman, uh, so essentially, this dude spent part. Okay, this person 
spent part of their childhood as a man and part as a woman, and then lived 40 years as a man, and then lived 40 more years as a woman. And read the book if you want to find out what the doctor found in the autopsy. So there is that. It's fascinating. And and it's it's because essentially like the king saying, no, you, you only have to, we, we want you to be a woman. You can only come back to France if you're a woman. And he's saying like, no, I don't want to be a woman. Uh, it's better for a man. And he's, if you want to come back, you can, you know, you just have to be a woman. And it's this intrigue that Silas Dean through his found friend Beaumark High uses to essentially blackmail the king into supporting the American Revolution. <laughs> it's wild. It is wild. Unlikely Allies by uh, Joel Richardson. I believe his name. That one's got to be here. That one. I always have that one around. Where are all my books? That one. The problem is I need to clean up because it's just a mess. Between my spouse and I sharing the desk. We've made a mess here. I can't believe I don't have it. I think it's Joel Richardson. Um, he was the first secret agent. Kind of, yeah. Yeah, he was literally the first secret agent. He was sent over, well, in, uh, late, in late 1775. Um, oh. Uh, so, yeah, that's before Nathan Hale, yeah. Uh, Cookie, I remember the room where it happened. Burr said, no one really knows how the game is played, the art of the trade, how the sausage gets made. We just assume that it happens. Oh, Sid. Hey, welcome, man. Uh, uh, you missed, what was whose person's name? Uh, the crossdresser was Chevalier de Eon, but the American who's important is Silas Dean. He's one of the most important American founders, gets zero credit, and gets murdered in the end of the book, by the way. So, yeah. He dedicates his entire fortune to the American Revolution. Is the reason we won at Saratoga, is the reason the French joined the war, arguably is the reason that the Patriots won the war. You could pretty easily make that argument. Uh, uh, Cookie, are you quoting the, the play? Uh, yes, that's essentially right. That's more or less what he talks about. Uh, but he gets into the details of what's happening uh, in that book, uh, again, Joseph Ellis, it's, it's, a, it's a pretty easy read. Anyone who's like, I'm interested in the American Revolution for the first time, that's the book I've sent them to for 20 years. If you, if you, if you do, you would like it. Absolutely, Sid. If you have any more questions, you know, I'm happy to hang out and answer questions if you guys have questions. This is, this is fun. Uh, yeah, I could do AMAs too, if there's something you want, but apparently we used to end trivia with AMAs. It's Friday. I got nothing to do. I wouldn't be here if I had something to do. We'd be doing this on Saturday. Um, Jason, on these longer, harder names, maybe spell them out if you can. Okay. Uh, which name? At the end of the song, he says, click boom. Yeah. You know, Cookie, I'm going to get back to that. Uh, Troy, uh, I'm not Troy. Uh, uh, Silas the Patriot. Okay, so Silas Dean. It's S I L A S. And then Dean is D-E-A-N-E. -E. Uh, you know, while I'm answering it, I could uh, pop this up. And I could probably pull up the books for you. Let's see. Um, uh, 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 Unlikely Allies is in the Jesuits. Here. Let's see. Is that there? Open in new tab. Is that gonna is that gonna blow it up for you guys? Did it work? Yeah, that's essentially it. Joel Richard Paul. All right, I was close. Unlikely allies. Uh, how a merchant, a playwright, and a spy saved the American Revolution. Um, so I don't know why he says click boom at the end of the song. Uh, yeah. Oh, you know what? I'll pull up the other books too. Uh. Uh, the rake who wrote the Constitution, uh, gentleman revolutionary. Yep, this is the Governor Morris one. Let's see, open a new tab. Uh, Governor Morris, I never know how to say his name. 
uh, Rick Rue with the Constitution. Uh, Chevalier de Eon, I think is how it's pronounced. Yes, he's in that too. Uh, yes, thank you, Sid. That is how you spell it. <laughs> I would not have been able to figure it out myself. Uh, and then the other one, the real one, the one you start with is Founding Brothers. And and two of the three are the ones that got me in to the war, like the Revolutionary War. There we go, Founding Brothers. This is uh, that's the book. I know there are people there are people in history circles who um, criticize Ellis for a variety of reasons. He does kind of pick the easy targets, like he writes about George Washington, John Adams, like they're the easy ones. <laughs> um, uh, but uh, you know, this book is really important. Um, yeah, Cookie, I, I'm not sure why it ends with the click boom. Uh, no one got shot. <laughs> um, they literally just met in the room. They met in a room. Jefferson, so Jefferson famously argues a lot with Hamilton. Uh, but let me, let me fix, let me fix this. Zoom in. There we go. There we go. Hamilton famously argues a lot with Jefferson, but Jefferson doesn't. When he first gets there, like, you got to remember, Jefferson arrives super late to the game. He's in France when Washington, the Constitution's ratified, Washington's elected president, Washington becomes president, and then chooses his staff, at which point he sends a letter to France telling Jefferson he's now Secretary of State. It takes two months to get across the water. Jefferson says, okay, and starts to slowly pack his belongings for the long trip home, at which point the Bastille is stormed and the French Revolution breaks out right in front of him. Now, this American who's been there talking about republicanism with Tom Paine for a while is kind of one of the causes of the French Revolution. Because Jefferson's been saying how sweet it is back home. By the time he gets in the boat, he goes back home to Virginia and then goes up to New York City. It's a year after Washington's been president that Jefferson's even there. At this point, James Madison's already written the Bill of Rights. He's, they've already kind of come to terms with, okay, we need to make some changes. Fine. Fine. We'll guarantee the people rights or the state's rights, uh, arguably. Uh, then uh, Ma Madison comes, uh, Jefferson shows up, and he, Madison, as they say in the play, is like, hey, Hamilton's trying to do this treasury plan. And Jefferson doesn't really know what to think about it. He had seen everything from afar, just like John Adams. He'd seen everything happen from across the world. So he doesn't immediately jump in and say, no, Hamilton's wrong. He hosts the dinner to let Madison and Hamilton kind of hash it out. And from our understanding, he was an unbiased moderator. They were honorable people. And if his job was to moderate the discussion, that's what he would have done. He would have picked a fancy French dinner. He would have set the table fancy. Like that, that's all true. And while we don't know what they talk about, we do know what they talk about because we know what the argument is. Hamilton wants this assumption plan. He wants to issue bonds so that private citizens and corporations can buy into the United States. Uh, he thought, you know, John Jay was later quoted by his son as having said, uh, those, who own the, those who own the country ought to run it. Uh, and that seems to be Hamilton's attitude. Uh, he is very much an elitist. And the results of the dinner is that Hamilton gets what he wants. He's able to sell bonds to private citizens to raise money to fund the government. He's able to start a national debt. That we, we don't technically still have. It disappeared a few times, but we still have. Uh, he, The consolidating of all the debts of the states really gave the national government a whole swing of power it never had before. And all James Madison gets is Washington, D.C. He gets the capital in Virginia. It's a real loss for Madison. Now, I'm not going to go too deep into my understanding of Madison and Hamilton and how I personally feel that Hamilton was able to dupe Madison on several occasions. Uh, and it wasn't until after this that Madison really realized that Hamilton had taken advantage of his... Madison was kind of a pushover. And as smart as he was, he was not necessarily the best politician. Sorry, Kyle Jenks. 
Madison Portrayer, who I absolutely adore, would not love hearing me say that. Uh, that being said, uh, that's what happens at the dinner. Now, we don't know what happened in the room, but we know why they went there, and we know what they left with. So, what actually happens at dinner isn't hugely important. Um, we are having a good night, Sid. Thank you so much. Uh, that's the name of our cat. Okay. Uh, small world is short for Sid Sidra. I don't. I don't get that reference. What? Oh, your name. Oh, your name is Sidra. Oh, okay. <laughs> okay. Cool. That's a really cool name, dude. Um. Madison was a good policymaker, but Hamilton was a better politician. Yeah. Yeah, Hamilton was strong-armed and Madison was a pushover. That's why things start to change when Jefferson gets there. Like, the Democratic-Republican Party, as we historically call them, they call themselves Republicans, but they are not modern Republicans. In fact, you can more directly link the modern Democratic Party to them, but wildly different, as we know. Parties change significantly over time. Uh, but we also reference them as Jeffersonian Republicans or Jeffersonian democracy. It's really like Madison's democracy that Jefferson kind of... Jefferson takes over because he's more strong-willed than Hamilton is. Uh, I'm sorry, the Madisons. He can put up more of a fight. And he starts fighting with Hamilton. And then when Adams becomes president, he brings the fight to his friend. Jefferson's amazingly interesting. He is simultaneously uh, a model of what's amazing and a model of what's disgusting about the united states he is the best and the worst of us it's what makes him so important uh in such an um, it, in I, I i don't know i don't know the right word to use such such a historic figure in our, our our nation's history i don't like the idea of great man history over the last several decades historians have started to avoid what's called great man history, where you look at one person and say, hey, you know, they're the best. You know, George Washington won the war and became president. He's the founding father. No, now we do essentially what I do with Founder of the Day. We understand that there are thousands of people all living at the same time, all doing their own little part for the greater picture that is history. Uh, but, Certainly, there are some figures that stand above the rest. <laughs> and George Washington is one of them. And Thomas Jefferson, who bounced up to number two on our list of top 100 this year, is essential to understanding the American founding. Especially because he missed the core of it. And he's often a super hypocrite. And his views change so much throughout his life. Like, you got to remember, like, Jefferson writes the Declaration of Independence when he's 32 years old. Which I notice some of my viewers might sound old. But to the rest of us, sounds very, very young. And uh, and then he's not president until he's approaching 60. There's a lot that goes on in there. That's a whole lifetime. Uh, that's an awesome name. My friend called our cat Sydney, but I only called it. Okay. <laughs> Your girlfriend named the cat Sydney? Okay, fair enough. I named my cat Harvest. And was immediately upset because I said, if I ever have a daughter, that would be the perfect name. <laughs> um, and my, my spouse brought a cat named Boston into the relationship, and it is the worst. You think I like a cat named Boston? No. no. <laughs> well, guys, uh, unless there's any questions, we've run pretty long here, but I'm having a great time answering this. Uh, I hope I answered your questions. I hope I didn't miss any. Um, I know there are other books I should probably recommend. Uh, if you're subscribed, if you're not subscribed, please subscribe. Definitely on your way out, hit like if you haven't. If you're new here, uh, hit the, if you, if you subscribe, hit the notification bell. It'll let you know when I go live with things like this, so you don't miss it. Um, who are the aggressive founding fathers? What about the meek? Maybe a video rating them. Aggressive. So, like I said, starting next Saturday, I'm going to start doing at least once, if not twice a month, like special event videos, like where I do the top 20. I'm not going to do top 100 anymore. That's an annual thing because that ended up taking three hours. Uh, but I, I am going to start doing that. What do you mean by aggressive and meek? Uh, meek I can do. That I think I know what you mean. But aggressive, like, 
as soldiers or in the boardroom. Uh, if you could like specify that, Jeremy, I'd be happy to. Um, sorry, uh, uh, I'm wondering about early American Chinese relations. Is there a history dating back to the revolution? Yeah, Sid. Where do you think the tea came from that they threw in Boston Harbor? All the tea was grown in China. It was being brought in by the British. That was part of the problem, is there were certain people who didn't want to go through Britain and just wanted to bring the tea. And that's why they were so angry at this tax. There's no reason for there to be a tax. You could do imposts, but don't tax us. There was always a history there. Heck, I mean, arguably, so arguably, Christopher Columbus was sailing for China. And we called them Indians, but that's a translation from uh, the, the Italian he was writing in his notebooks. Uh, he was—he may have thought he was get to India. They didn't know very well what the eastern coast of Asia looked like. What they did know is that Portugal had just started sailing around the Horn of Africa, and now we're with the vibrant trade routes on the Indian Ocean, which up to that point had always had to go by land. That's what made them want to cross the ocean 250 years before the American Revolution. And just to note, also, we live closer to the American founding than the founders lived to Christopher Columbus. To put some context on it. Uh, anyway. <laughs> um, yes. Now, you know what? Let me pull up here. I'm going to pop over to my website here because I'm going to type in China because I forget the name. But there were a few people who right off the bat, once the revolution starts, start sailing to China. Uh, the Empress of China, Samuel Shaw. Samuel Shaw was the first person. Uh, I, I It might have been before Washington was president. I can't remember. Uh, let me pull it up. Uh, he... Samuel Shaw fought in the siege of Boston for under Henry Knox. Uh, after the war, uh, several Americans invested into a ship called the Empress of China, including Robert Morris, who was the financier of the revolution. Uh, it was... Uh, Shaw was what's called super cargo, uh, which is a non-political representative of an agency or company. So, like, he wasn't a diplomat sent by the United States. He was a diplomat sent by the company that owned the boat, Empress of China. And he sails around the world to China uh, while he, and this is like as the revolution's ending. Excuse me, because I'll remind you, at the time, for example, India, China was run by the empire, but India had basically been conquered and was run by the British East India Company. Not even Britain. Britain gave the rights to run India, the colony of India, to this company. And they ran it kind of harsh from times. Uh, and it was certain revolts. I heard arguments. Uh, if you listen to one of the earlier episodes of the uh, History That Doesn't Suck podcast with uh, Professor Greg, who was nice enough to come hang out here one time, uh, he goes into the depths. In fact, if you want to learn about uh, this topic more, I recommend it. It's like his first or maybe his second or third podcast. He goes real deep into the how... The American Revolution was a global problem. It wasn't just these patriots who didn't want to pay taxes. It was there were global problems going on. And it was certain things that they were doing. Uh, there was a famine. That's it. There was a famine in India that had severely hurt the amount of things getting exported from India, which affected the amount of money being raised in Britain, which is why Britain needed to raise more money, which is why they put a tax on tea and stamps in the first place. Yes, the, argue, the, the discussion of, you know, needing to pay for the troops stationed in America, that certainly was true, but it wasn't the only thing going on. So, yes, to answer your question, Sid, absolutely. There were always relations with China since before there was an America. It helped start the revolution, uh, and they immediately sent Samuel Shaw and someone else. Who's the other guy's name? I haven't used him. Tom, Thomas Randall, who were, again, super cargo, which is essentially ambassadors representing a company because companies could essentially have their own things there. And when, when he was there, like, he went to China two or three times. Uh, he was sent... Oh, when he was there. Oh, that's right. He was there, and during the 1780s, since he was already there, the Continental Congress chose Saw, Shaw as the first consul to China. Now, a consul's not an ambassador. A consul is the 
like the head of an embassy. So while you can't have diplomatic relations, you can't negotiate treaties with the nation you're in, you are the representative of any other American citizens there. And then I'm pretty sure there was like, oh, he died on his way back. Yeah, that's right. That's sad. Rounding the Cape of Good Hope. But uh, I'm pretty sure there was like, they like captured a bunch of British people. Let me pull this up. I wrote this like a year ago. So let me refresh myself. Uh, I have a few articles about this. I'm just looking at my website, reading what I wrote as my source. So, um, yeah, I'm not going to get, yeah. Oh, the Canton War. That's right. The Canton War. November of 1784, which almost interrupt in, erupted into war. I need to edit that because that's a wrong word. Uh, Samuel Shaw recounts that an English ship was honoring a guest who had come from dinner by shooting off a cannon. Unfortunately, the blast killed one Chinese person and injured two others. So the British have guests on their boat, and they're like, they do what they did back then and shot off a cannon to be like, eh, it's celebration, and they accidentally killed some Chinese people. The Chinese were not happy about this. They demanded the person who shot the gun be handed over for punishment. The English refused because they were like, he just did what we told him. You know, he's just trying to welcome his friends. It was an accident. Uh, China called in all its citizens and all the European nations called in their closest ships. So like China calls in the citizens to form a militia to go get the guy. And all the, it's not just America and China, all the European nations had ships in China to buy some tea. And all the European nations came together. The Americans kind of stayed on the side because literally it's November 1784. So just got the peace treaty back just got recognition from england to be an independent nation uh and it appeared that it might war might break out and then the english and the chinese have several meetings and they resolve they thought they resolved the issue but the the this guy george smith was the englishman who was talking to the chinese they kidnap him and say you can't have him back unless we get the gunner and eventually they did give this gunner whose name i was unable to locate this gunner they eventually tr exchange him for george smith uh and he was like they were like only if you give him a fair trial and they said yeah we'll give him a fair trial and then oh what do you know he was convicted and executed so that's what the americans were dealing with in november of 1784 <laughs> with the first consul to china that's what he had going on yes yeah, it no no problem thank you so much for coming uh uh, most aggressive on battlefield, most on political situations. Meek, weakest, docile. Okay. Well, we can go. I can do those. I can do those. I have one plan for next week. Uh, it's basically going to be early. The I don't know how to word it yet, but uh, earliest revolutionaries. Like the earliest. Uh, again, I don't know how to word it, but like er, first radicals or something like that. Top Top 20 first radical something like that uh and with that man we just hit two hours so i don't want to brain drain you i do appreciate you guys hanging out and asking these questions this is a ton of fun for me i hope you feel the same way as always uh follow me on the social medias or anything through the links below uh, we also have the discord channel which as i said before it's not super active yet it was uh, i want the meme thing to go if you guys have american revolution memes check out the discord channel in the link below uh and Put some memes up because I want to on trivia night do the best memes of the week. I think that would be a lot of fun. Uh, most extreme founding fathers. Uh, Governor Morse. <laughs> All right, guys. With that, I am out. You are amazing. Uh, I forget what day it is to sign off. Was it Peacefield? It's John Adams' place. We sign off with Peacefield. So I will be back with you guys. Look for. Uh, Goose Van Schenk tomorrow morning and uh, Peacefield.